Is it really too late to learn new skills? You missed your chance to be a prodigy, but there's still growth left for grown-ups. By Margaret Talbo, January 11, 2021. The joys and occasional embarrassments of being a novice could be an antidote to the strain of being a perfectionist. Among the things I have not missed since entering middle age is the sensation of being an absolute beginner. It has been decades since I've sat in a classroom in a gathering cloud of incomprehension, Algebra 2, 10th grade, or, sincere, or sincerely tried lesson after lesson to acquire a skill that was clearly not destined to play a large role in my life, Modern Dance, 12th grade. Learning to ride a bicycle in my early 30s was an exception, a little mortifying when my husband had to run alongside the bike as you would with a child but ultimately rewarding. Less so was the time when a group of Japanese school children tried to teach me origami at a public event where I was the guest of honor. I'll never forget their somber puzzlement as my clumsy fingers mutilated yet another paper crane. Like Tom Vanderbilt, a journalist and the author of Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning, I learn new facts all the time but new skills, skills seldom. Journalists regularly drop into unfamiliar subcultures and domains of expertise, learning enough at least to ask the right questions. The distinction he draws between his energetic stockpiling of declarative knowledge, or knowing that, and this scant attention to procedural knowledge, or knowing how, is familiar with, to me. The prospect of reinventing myself as, say, a late blooming skier or ceramicist or marathon runner sparks only an idle interest, something like wondering what it might be like to live in some small town you pass on the highway. There is certainly a way to put a positive spin on that reluctance. If you love your job and find it intellectually and creatively fulfilling, you may not feel the urge to discover other rooms in the house of your mind, whatever hidden talents and lost callings may repose there. But there are less happy forces at work too. There's the fear of being bad at something you think is worthwhile, and maybe even more so, being seen to be bad at it, when you have accustomed yourself to knowing more or less what you're doing. What's the point of starting something new when you know you'll never be much good at it? Middle age, to go by my experience and plenty of research, brings greater emotional equanimity, an unspectacular advantage but a relief. The lows aren't as low, the highs not as high. Starting all over at something would seem to put you right back into that emotional churn, exhilaration, self-doubt, but without the open-ended possibilities and renewable energy of youth. Parties mean something different and far more exciting when you're younger and you might meet a person who will change your life. So does learning something new. It might be fun, but it's less likely to transform your destiny at 40 or 50. In, quote, Old in Art School, A Memoir of Starting Over, end quote, Nell Painter, a distinguished historian, as distinguished a historian as they come, legions of honors, seven books, a Princeton professorship, recounts her experience earning first a BFA at Rutgers and then an MFA at the Rhode Island, Univers Rhode Island School of Design while in her 60s. As a black woman used to feeling either uncomfortably singled out or ignored in public spaces where black women were few, she was taken aback in art school to find that old was such an overwhelming signifier, quote, it wasn't that I stopped being my individual self, or stopped being black, or stopped being female, but that old, now linked to my sex, obscured everything else beyond old lady. End quote. Painter finds herself periodically undone by the overt discouragement of some of her teachers or the silence of her fellow students during group crits of her work, wondering if they were, quote, critiquing me old black woman totally out of place, end quote, or her work. Reading her book, 
I was full of admiration for Painter's willingness to take herself out of a world in which her currency, scholarly accomplishment, commanded respect and put herself into a different one where that coin often went unrecognized altogether, all out of exaltation in the, in the art making itself. But her quest also induced some anxiety in me. Painter is no dilettante. Dilettante? She's clearly about not wanting to be a, a Sunday painter. She is determined to be an artist and recognized as such. But let me look up this word. Dilettante. Dilettante. A person who cultivates an area of interest such as the arts without real commitment or knowledge. Dilettante. Painter is no dilettante. She's clearly about not wanting to be a Sunday painter. She is determined to be an artist and recognized as such. But dilettante is one of those words which deter people from taking up new pursuits as adults. Many of us are wary of being dismissed as dabblers, people who have a little too much leisure, who are a little too cute and privileged in our pastimes. This seems a narrative worth pushing back against. We might remember, as Vanderbilt points out, that the word dilettante comes from the Italian for to delight. In the 18th century, a group of aristocratic Englishmen popularized the term, founding the Society of the Dilettanti to undertake tours of the continent, promote the art of knowledgeable conversation, collect art, and subsidize archaeological expeditions. Frederick II of Prussia dissed the dilettante, dilettante as lovers of the arts and scientists who understand quote, understand them only superficially, but who, however, are ranked in superior class to those who are totally ignorant. Dis is to speak disrespectfully to or criticize. They were, of course, wealthy with oodles of time on their hands. The term turned more pejorative in modern times with the rise of professions and of licensed expertise. But if you think of dilettantism as an endorsement of learning for learning's sake, not for remuneration or career advancement, but merely because it delights the mind, what's not to love? Maybe it could be an antidote to the self-reported perfectionism that has grown steadily more prevalent among college students in the past three decades. Thomas Curran and Andrew P. Hill, the authors of a 2019 study on perfectionism amongst, among American, British, and Canadian college students, have written that, quote, increasingly young people hold irrational ideas for themselves Ideals that manifest in unrealistic expectations for academic and professional achievement, how they should look, and what they should own, end quote, and are worried that other things will judge them harsh others will judge them harshly harshly for their perceived failings. This is not, the researchers point out, good for mental health. In the US we'll be living for the foreseeable future in a competitive individualistic, allegedly meritocratic society where we can inspect and troll and post humiliating videos of one another all the live long day. Being willing to involve yourself in something you're mediocre at but intrinsically enjoy, to give yourself over to imperfect pursuit of something you'd like to know how to do for no particular reason, seems like a small form of resistance. Tom Vanderbilt, Tom Vanderbilt got motivated to start learning again during the time he spent waiting about while his daughter did her round of lessons and activities. Many of us have been there, quote, on some windowless lower level of a school huddled, huddled near an electrical outlet to keep your device alive, end quote, as he nicely puts it, waiting, 
avoiding the parents who want to talk scores and rankings, trying to shoehorn a bit of work into a stranded hour or two. But not many of us are inspired to wonder, in such moments, why we ourselves aren't in there practicing our embouchure. Embouchure. The way in which a player applies the mouth to the mouthpiece of a brass or wind instrument. Embouchure. Embouchure. Why we ourselves aren't in there practicing our embouchure on the trumpet or our salcho on the ice. This may speak to my essential laziness, but I have fond memories of curling up on the child-sized couch in the musty, overheated basement of our local community center, reading a book for a stolen hour, while my kids took drum lessons and fencing classes. Vanderbilt, on the other hand, asks himself whether, quote, we, in our constant chaperoning of these lessons, were imparting a subtle lesson that learning was for the young, end quote. Rather than molder on the rather than molder on the sidelines, he decides to throw himself into acquiring five new skills. That's his term though. I started to think of these skills as accomplishments, in the way that marriageable Jane Austen heroines have them, talents that make a long evening pass more agreeably, that can turn a person into more engaging company for herself as much as for others. Vanderbilt's search is for, quote, the naive optimism, the hypervigilant alertness that comes with novelty and insecurity, the willingness to look foolish, and the permission to ask obvious questions, the unencumbered beginner's mind, end quote. And so he tries to achieve competence, not mastery, in chess, singing, surfing, drawing, and making. He learns to weld a wedding ring to replace two he lost surfing. He adds juggling, not because he's so interested in it, but because, with its steep and obvious learning curve, most people starting from scratch can learn to juggle three balls in a few days. And it's fun factor. Juggling is an oft-used task for laboratory studies of how people learn. These accomplishments aren't likely to help his job performance as a journalist, or to be marketable in any way, except in so far as the learning of them forms the idea for the book. Vanderbilt is good on the specific joys and embarrassments of being a late blooming novice, or kook, as surfers sometimes call gauche beginners. Gauche. Gauche. Lacking ease or grace, unsophisticated and socially awkward. Gauche. How you think you know how to sing a song, but actually know only how to sing along with one, so that when you hear your own voice, stripped of the merciful camouflage the recorded version provides, quote, you're not only hearing the song as you've never quite heard it, you are hearing your voice as you've never quite heard it, end quote. That's funny, I kind of feel a bit similar about doing these narrations. Okay, continuing on. The particular democratic pleasure of making that voice coalesce with others in a choir, coupled with the way when friends and family come to see your adult group perform, quote, the parental smile of eternal indulgence gives way to a more complicated expression, end quote. The fact that feedback, especially the positive kind, stressing what you're doing right, delivered by an actual human teacher or coach watching what you do, is crucial for a beginner, which might seem obvious except that, in an age when so many instructional videos of every sort are available online, you might get lulled into thinking you could learn just as well without it. The weirdness of the phenomenon that, for many of us, our drawing skills are frozen forever, as they were when we were kids, the weirdness of the phenomenon that, for many of us, our drawing skills are frozen forever as they were when we were kids. Children tr tend to draw better, Vanderbilt explains, when they are around five years old and rendering what they feel, 
Later they fall into what the psychologist Howard Gardner calls, quote, the doldrums of literalism, end quote, trying to draw exactly what they see, but without the technical skill or instruction that would allow them to do so effectively. Many of us never progress beyond that stage. Personally, I'm stuck at about age eight when I filled notebooks with ungainly scampering horses. Yet I was entranced by how both Vanderbilt and, in her far more ambitious way, Painter, described drawing as an unusually absorbing, almost meditative task, one that makes you look at the world differently even when you're not actually doing it and pours you into undistracted flow when you are. One problem with teaching an old dog new tricks is that certain cognitive abilities decline with age, and by age, I mean starting as early as one's 20s. Mental processing speed is the big one. Maybe that's one reason that air traffic controllers have to retire at age 56, while English professors can stay at it indefinitely. Vanderbilt cites the work of Neil Charnas, a psychology professor at Florida State University, who has shown that the older a chess player is, the slower she is to perceive a threatened check, no matter what her skill level. Processing speed is why I invariably lose against my daughter, pretty good-naturedly, if you ask me, at a game that I continue to play, Anomia. In this game, players flip cards bearing the names of categories, dog breeds, Olympic athletes, talk show hosts, whatever, and if your card displays the same small symbol as the one of your opponents does, you try to be the first to call out something belonging to the other person's category. If my daughter and I each had 10 minutes to list as many talk show hosts as we could, I'd probably triumph. After all, I have several decades of late night TV viewing over her. But with speed the essence, a second's lag in my response in my response speed cooks my goose every time. Still, as Richard Carlgaard notes in his reassuring book, Late Bloomers, The Hidden Strengths of Learning and Succeeding at Your Own Pace, there are, cogn there are cognitive compensations. Quote, our brains are constantly forming neural networks and pattern recognition capabilities that we didn't have in our youth when we had blazing synaptic horsepower, end quote, he writes. Fluid intelligence, which encompasses the capacity to suss out novel challenges and think on one's feet, suss out novel challenges and think on one's feet, favors the young. Suss. Suss is realize or grasp something. But crystallized intelligence, the ability to draw on one's accumulated store of knowledge, expertise, and finger spitzing goof is often enriched by advancing age. And there's more to it than that. Particular to cognitive skills rise and fall at different rates across the lifespan, as Joshua as Joshua K. Hearthstone, now a professor of psychology at Boston College, and Laura T. Germain, 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 a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, show in a 2015 paper on the subject. Processing speed speaks in the late teens, short-term memory for names at around 22, short-term memory for faces at around 30, vocabulary at around 50, in some studies even at around 65, while social understanding, including the ability to recognize and interpret other people's emotions, rises at around 40 and tends to remain high. Quote, not only is there no age at which humans are performing at peak at all cognitive tasks, end quote, Harstone and Germain conclude, quote, there may not be an age at which humans are at peak on most cognitive tasks, end quote. This helps Karlsgaard's case that we need a, quote, kinder clock for human development, end quote. Societal pressure on young adults to specialize and succeed right out of college 
is wrong-headed and oppressive on the one end of life as patronizing attitudes towards toward the old are on the other. The gift of crystallized intelligence explains why some people can bloom spectacularly when they're older, especially perhaps in a field like literature where a rich vein of life experience can be a writerly asset. Annie Prowl... Prowl... Annie Prowl published her first novel at the age of 56, Raymond Chandler at 51. Frank McCourt, who had been a high school teacher in New York City for much of his career, published his first book, the Pulitzer Prize winning memoir, Angela's Ashes, at 66. Edith Wharton, who had been a society matron prone to neurasthenia, and tapped in a gilded cage of a marriage, produced no novels until she was 40. Publishing fiction awakened her from what she described as, quote, a kind of torpor, torpor, a familiar feeling for the true late bloomer. Quote, I had groped my way through my vocation, end quote, Wharton wrote, quote, and thereafter I never questioned that storytelling was my job, end quote. Neurasthenia. Neurasthenia, an ill-defined medical condition characterized by lassitude, fatigue, headache, and irrationability associated chiefly with emotional disturbances. Neurasthenia. Neurasthenia. In science and technology, we often think of the people who make precocious breakthroughs as the true geniuses. Einstein developing his special theory of relativity at 26. Einstein himself once said that, quote, a person who has not made his great contribution to science before the age of 30 will never do so, end quote. A, classical, a classic paper on the relationship between age and scientific creativity showed that American Nobel winners tended to have done their prize winning work at 36 in physics. 39 in chemistry, and 41 in medicine. That creativity rose in the 20s and 30s and began a gradual decline in the 40s. That picture has been complicated by more recent research. According to a 2014 working paper for the National Bureau of Economic Research, which undertook a broad review of the research on age and scientific breakthroughs, the, age, the average age at which people make significant contributions to science has been rising during the 20th century, notably to 48 for physicists. One, expl one explanation might be the burden of knowledge that people have to take on in many scientific disciplines has increased. Meanwhile, a 2016 paper in Science that considered a wider range of scientists than Nobelists concluded that, quote, the highest impact work in a scientist's career is randomly distributed within her body of work. That is, the highest impact work can be, with the same probability, anywhere in the sequence of papers published by a scientist. It could be the first publication, could appear mid-career, or could be a scientist's last publication. When it comes to more garden variety late blooming, the kind of new competencies that Vanderbilt is seeking, he seems to have gone about it in the most promising way. For one thing, it appears that people may learn better when they are learning multiple skills at once, as Vanderbilt did. A recent study that looked at the experiences of adults over 55 who learn three new skills at once, for example, Spanish, drawing, and music composition, found that they not only acquired proficiency in these areas, but improved their cognitive functioning overall, including work, including working in episodic memory. In a 2017 paper, Rachel Wu, a neuroscientist at UC Riverside, and her co-authors George W. Reebok and Fang Vanky Lin, 
proposed six, six factors that they think are needed to sustain cognitive development, factors that tend to be less present in people's lives as they enter young adulthood and certainly as they grow old. These include what the Stanford psychologist professor Carol Dweck calls a, quote, growth mindset, end quote. The belief that abilities are not fixed but can improve with effort. A commitment to serious rather than hobby learning, in which the learner casually picks up skills for a short period of time and then quits due to difficulty, disinterest, or other time commitments. A forgiving environment that promotes what Dweck calls a not yet rather than a cannot approach, and a habit of learning multiple skills simultaneously, which may help by encouraging the application of capacities acquired in one dom domain to another. What these elements have in common, Wu and her co-authors point out, is that they tend to, to replicate how children learn. So eager have I been all my life to leave behind the subjects I was bad at and hunker down with the ones I was good at, a balm in many ways, that until reading these books, I'd sort of forgotten the youthful pleasure of moving out our little tokens ahead on a bunch of winding pathways of aptitude, lagging behind here, surging ahead there. I've been out of touch with that sense of life as something that might encompass multiple possibilities for skill and artistry. But now I've been thinking about taking up singing in a serious way again, learning some of the jazz standards my mom, a professional singer, used to croon to me at bedtime. If learning a child's if learning like a child sounds a little airy fairy, whatever the neuroscience research says, try recalling what it felt like to learn how to do something new when you didn't really care what your performance of it said about your place in the world, when you didn't know what you didn't know. It might feel like a whole new beginning. Published in the print edition of the January 18th, 2021 issue with the headline, Starting Fresh. Margaret Talbo is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of The Entertainer, Movies, Magic, and My Father's 20th Century. Uh, there were two words I wanted to look up. One was bomb. And one was croon. Balm. Balm. Something that has a comforting, soothing, or restorative effect. Or a tree which yields a fragrant, resinous substance, especially used in medicine. Or a bushy herb of the mint family with leaves smelling and tasting of lemon. The other one was croon. Croon. Hum or sing in a soft, low voice, especially in a sentimental manner. A soft, low voice or tone. Um, this article reminded me a bit about uh, some stuff in I, I read in... Uh, Algorithms to live by. Uh, yeah, algorithms to live by the computer science of human decisions, um, which likened that reduction in processing speed uh, as you grow older to the processing speed of a computer as uh, memory, as its memory fills up. So uh, the point was that we look at it, the, the point that was also made in this article is that um, when we first describe that, uh, that reduction in the ability to, say, answer a question or process information uh, quickly, uh, we, we think about that as a negative thing. However, um, if it's due to the fact that you have more knowledge to search through, then 
it starts to sound uh, like less less of a bad thing, which I think is a point that they that um, Miss Talbo also makes in this article. Um, one last thing, I'm just gonna look up Talbo. Yeah, it's not Talbo. Talbot. Talbot. Um, sorry, Margaret Talbot. Uh, Margaret Talbot sounds a little more, a little better. Okay, thanks for listening.